So what regression does is fit a model to our data with the least amount of error. And this provides us with what's called a regression equation. This is how we can begin to predict our dependent variable based on the behavior of our independent variable. And with simple linear regression, that's gonna be one predictor. So when we talk about regression, the outcome variable is our dependent variable and our predicted variable is our independent variable. So in the future, when I use those terms, just know that that's, that's pretty much interchangeable. Now, the regression equation itself is pretty simple. It actually might look very familiar to some of you because it's also the equation for a line. And the equation is that our predicted y, our predicted um, dependent variable would equal a alpha, which is our intercept. And we're gonna talk about these values more specifically in a little bit. So our intercept plus our slope or our beta times x, which is our uh, predictor variable or our IV. Now this is our actual regression equation, but in a theoretical regression equation, you'll also have the addition of some error at the end. But with our regression output, you're not expected to also include error. Now you'll get a beta value, which is simply the slope of the relationship between one variable and another, the predictor variable and the dv. And this is what's included in our null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis for regression is that our beta will equal zero. If beta equals zero, then that would suggest no relationship. We can't predict our dv from our independent variable. So if our beta is significantly different from zero, either in the positive or the negative direction, that would mean that our predictor or our independent variable is a good predictor of our outcome variable. And with our research questions that we defined earlier, we'll have three separate regression equations and three se separate predictors of judges' ratings. So let's go ahead and identify our regression equations for all three of our research equations. Our, sorry, for all three of our research questions. Okay, so we can pop over into Stata again and actually fit our models. The command here is pretty intuitive. For regression, it's simply regress. And now it is really important the order in which you place your variables. Um, while above with our correlation, it doesn't really matter the order you lay out your variables. Here for, for a hypothesis test, you always want to have your dependent variable first. So our dependent variable here is ratings, and our independent variable for this research question is research, hours spent researching the project. And this is going to be the same for pretty much all of our hypothesis tests. So t-test, ANOVA, you always want to include your dependent variable first. Right, so when we run that command, we can see we now have the output for our simple regression. And there is kind of a lot going on here, so I'll break it up piece by piece. This first uh, sort of block of numbers, that's actually considered um, the ANOVA table. You don't need to interpret that, at least for this week. This will become a lot more important um, later on in the semester or later on in the session and then into 349. So you don't really have to worry about the ANOVA table for today. But there is really important information in our model statistics. So this block is considered our model statistics, and we get a test statistic for the model as a whole, and that's an F value. And then a P value associated with that F statistic. And this is simply telling us if the model including our predictors is better than a model with no predictors. So a, a significant p-value here would simply mean that our model is significantly better than no predictors at all. And just a hint, if the, model if the model is significant, that means at least one of our predictors is significant. And here we only have one predictor, so we can be pretty certain that our single predictor is going to be significant. Right? And then finally here, we have our R squared value. And the R squared tells us the proportion of the variability 
in our dependent variable that can be accounted for by our independent variable. So let's talk about this in more relatable terms. I always find it's easiest to explain this uh, by using a Venn diagram. If we consider the circle, the total number of reasons for a judge's rating, we wanna know if the hour spent researching is influencing judges' ratings at all. And then this circle would be the hours spent on the project. Okay. And with this R squared value of um, 0.27, which is a proportion, this is saying that 27.34% of the variability in judges rating. So all of these reasons for the rating can be accounted for by research. And that's what this overlap is here. And R squared is given to us as a proportion. So if you multiply it by 100, you'll get the percentage. So according to this model fit, about 27.34% of all of the reasons for coming to the final rating can be accounted for by hours spent researching. All right, and then finally in the output, we have our individual predictor statistics. Once we get into multiple regression, we'll have many more lines in this table here. But for now, with simple regression, we really only need to interpret this research line. And this table is how we're going to determine our regression equation. More specifically, this coefficient line here, or this coefficient column. The coefficient for our predictor research is the slope of the line, or our beta. And the coefficient for this constant term here is the y-intercept. So that's the value or the predicted value of our, of our dependent variable ratings if a student spent zero hours studying. So if a student spent zero hours researching, we would predict based on this model, a judge rating of negative 16. Well, that doesn't really make much sense. Theoretically, you'd probably never have a judge score of negative 16, but based on this line of best fit or this regression equation rather, if a student spent zero hours studying, we might predict a value of negative 16. So now you can start to see how, uh, what, what we mean when we talk about predicting. So predicting ratings based on hours spent researching. And now we can go ahead and determine our regression equation. So our predicted y is going to equal the constant, which is negative 16.35, plus our beta coefficient, which is 5.75, for our predictor hours spent researching, and that's times our actual predictor. So let's say you have a student come to you as an expert psychology statistician and say, I don't wanna spend any more than five hours researching this project. What do you think my rating is gonna be? Can, will I still get a, a decent rating? The way you determine that is by plugging in five into our um, X value here. So your predicted Y would be negative 16.35 plus our slope 5.75 times five. And if you plug that into a calculator, you would get a predicted rating of 12.4. Right, so based on this predicted rating, you'd probably tell the student to spend a little bit more time researching their project. But you'd also wanna let them know that the amount of time they spend researching really only accounts for um, less than 30% of the variability in judges' ratings. 
So while it's important to spend time researching the topic, making sure you have a good understanding, it's not going to be the only thing that goes into the overall judge's score. So you, you want to make sure that it's also uh, that you also spend time building it and that it's also innovative. You could spend all your time on a boring project that everyone's done before, um, but if it's not innovative, then you're probably not going to get the best score. All right, so that's the regression equation, but there is a, a, a few more things that I want to, to point out before we move on to the next model. And that is our T statistic and P value. So our T is the associated test, st test statistic that's associated with our um, beta coefficient. And then the P value is whether that's a significant predictor or not. So if you recall that our null hypothesis for a regression is that our beta coefficient equals zero, if this P value here is less than 0.05, that means we would reject that null hypothesis. And what this is simply telling us is that our beta coefficient 5.75 is significantly different from zero. And that would mean it's a significant predictor. And then finally, we also have our 95% confidence interval. And this is telling us that we can be very certain up to 95% confidence that if we were to run this analysis again, let's say on the next year's round of, um, round of science projects, that our beta coefficient would be between 1.6 and 9.89. And a little tip, if this 95% confidence interval crosses zero, so if one of the bounds was negative and the other is positive, that would suggest that we are not very confident that our beta coefficient will ever not be zero. And if that's the case, our test statistic is probably going to be non-significant. All right, so that's all of the nitty gritty of how to interpret this output. For now, we're really only going to interpret our model statistics here and our predictor statistic here, as well as our constant coefficient. All right, so let's go ahead and run the next regression and um, fit that model equation. And let's take a look at the regression for, or the um, research question for ratings based on hours spent building the project. Okay, we get a very similar layout here. Right off the bat, we can see that our regression model is non-significant and that we predict 13.13% of the variability in judges' ratings. So if you think about that Venn diagram again, the overlap here would be much less compared to um, hours spent researching the project. And overall, what this is saying is that our model with the predictor hours spent building is not significantly different from no model at all, or from a model with no predictors at all. And now if you recall back to our correlation matrix, this p-value might actually look really similar to you. If we scroll up to that correlation matrix, we can see that the p-value for the relationship between ratings and hours spent building is exactly the same. So if we have a non-significant correlation and we run a simple regression, it's also going to be non-significant. Now this only works for simple regression. Once you start including multiple variables in your in your analysis, you might find that a significant correlation, the predictor is non-significant, or you might have a non-significant correlation, but with multiple predictors, the predictor itself is significant. So you can't go off correlation alone unless you're doing simple regression. Okay, and then unsurprisingly, our predictor beta is non-significant. We have a p-value of 0.08, which tells us that our correlation coefficient of 0.55 is not significantly different from zero. And we can also see that our confidence intervals does cross zero. Our lower bound is negative and our upper bound is positive. But let's go ahead and type out our regression equation. 
So our predicted Y, our predicted rating would be 20.49. And remember that 20.49 20 is the predicted judge rating if the student spent zero hours building. So if the student spends zero hours building their project, they would still have a fairly, fairly reasonably high um, judge rating. And then our beta, 0.55. Right, so we can conclude that by itself, our spent building is not significantly predicting judges' ratings. So again, you have your student client. You can tell them as long as they spend enough time building the project so that it's, you know, so that you have an end product, that's all that really matters. The amount of time isn't going to influence judge ratings. Right, and then our final model or our final research question asks if we can predict ratings from how innovative the project was. Again, the command is regress, our DV followed by our IV. Right, and here we can see we have a significant model. Our P is less than 0.05. And we're predicting 43.64% of the variability in judge ratings from how innovative the project is alone. So again, if you imagine those circles, let's say this is the circle for judge rating, about 50% of the variability in reasons for the judge rating can be accounted for by how innovative the project is which is quite a bit more compared to um, how many hours they spent building. So again, this overlap, that's what we're talking about when we talk about um, variability explained. And again, this would be about 43.64% of the variability can be explained by how innovative the project is alone. All right, and we can fill in our regression equation as well. We do have a significant predictor our P is less than 0.05, which means our correlation coefficient or our beta is significantly different from zero. Right, and if we fill in the equation, we know that if the project wasn't innovative of, at all, if it had a score of zero, the predicted judge score would be 15.08. And then our slope is 8.14 times our predictor variable. All right, so taken together with these three separate simple regressions, we would probably let the student know that how innovative the project is, is the most important aspect of judge ratings because it accounts for the most amount of variability based on our R squared value. And that makes sense. Judges who are probably judging each year, they don't wanna see the same volcano or the same potato clock every single year. All right, and now that we've run our regressions and we fit our um, regression equations, we need to determine or we need to confirm that our regression model meets all of the assumptions of regression. And this we can only do after we actually fit the model because the assumptions of regression are all about residuals.